Welcome to PowerShell Day 2. So if you remember yet from yesterday, we went over the PowerShell overview. What is PowerShell? Why is PowerShell used? What is PowerShell ISE? Then we discussed variables. We discussed the five different variable types. And then we went over operators. We talked about mathematical operators, logical operators, comparison operators, and array operations. Today we're going to go over useful techniques in the morning, and then we're going to go over flow control in the afternoon. Uh, mainly dealing with flow control or if else statements and our switches. But before we get into today's material, I want to go ahead and do a, a quick review of what we went over yesterday. So if you don't mind, just go ahead and pausing after each question. I'll go ahead and give you the answer and then make sure that you understand this. Anytime you see a quiz, uh, it will be a uh, possibility that these questions will show up on your verbal your verbal exam. Again, remember for the verbal, you have to get at least eight out of 10 uh, to pass. Question number one, what are the five variable types? The answer to this is BNASH, so Boolean, numbers, arrays, strings, and hash tables. Question two, what is the percent operator and what does it do? The percent operator is the modulus operator. And again, it gives the remainder of a division problem. Question number three, strings use what characters at the beginning and the end of the text? Uh, strings will use quotation marks to show that whatever is inside of them is a, in fact, a string. Question four, what logical operator returns true when either statement is true? This would be the OR operator. Five, what logical operator returns true when both statements are true? This is the AND operator. Question six, what logic operator returns true when one and only one statement is true? That would be the XOR operator or the exclusive OR. Remember one or the other, but not both. Question seven, if I want to view the fourth item in an array, what index number should I choose? Index three would give you the fourth item in the array. Remember indexes start at zero. Question eight, if there are 19 items in the array, what will the length operator return? In this case, it will return 19. The length operator returns the number of items in the array. Question number nine, what do hash tables hold? Hash tables hold key value pairs. All right, that's it for the quiz. Make sure again that you are going over these answers and that you are ready for the oral exam, which will be the second to last day of this block. All right, so let's go ahead and get into today's material. Again, the first half of the day, we're going to go over useful techniques. And the second half of the day, we're going to get into flow control. So for the first half of the day, we're going to talk about how do we save, how do we run scripts using ISE? And we kind of already went over that yesterday, but we'll do a brief overview. Next, we'll talk about reading errors. How do we read errors? How do we uh, get all the information that we need from that error page uh, and fix the error that we did? Next, we'll talk about commenting in code, uh, which we already discussed uh, yesterday. Then we'll talk about directories and folders and files and how do we change directories. Then we'll get into writing or outputting to the screen. Then next, we'll go ahead and how do we create text files? Then we'll talk about how to write to a text file. And all of this will be in PowerShell, of course. Then we'll talk about how do we read from files. And lastly, we'll get into user input and asking the user to enter information and us collect it inside of PowerShell. So again, from yesterday, we've already talked about PowerShell ISE. We talked about opening up PowerShell ISE. Uh, we talked about using the play button, which is going to run the script in that script pane. Uh, and then again, we talked about how to go ahead and divide it into if you like it up and down or left and right showing your script pane versus your console pane. So again, if you have any other questions, go ahead and go back to yesterday's video uh, where it talked about PowerShell ISE. All right, so for today, the biggest, uh, the first concept that we're gonna discuss is error reading. So when writing scripts or even putting inputs into the command prop, errors are expected. I don't know how many times um, we, you know, we expect 
experts to know exactly what they're doing and never get errors. But really, that is impossible. It doesn't matter how long you've been coding. You will eventually get errors because that's just the nature of the beast. You will always have some sort of error as you're as you're typing them out. And again, it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for you know one day or 20 years. Uh, you will either have like a, a syntax error where you misspell or logical error or just something like that. And it's very, very important. The better the programmer you are, the better you are at fixing your mistakes and reading those errors. It gives you a lot of, the error messages give you a lot of information. And as long as you can kind of dissect that error message, then you can fix the error and get back to coding. And that's the biggest thing is, is trying to cut down on the amount of time that you're fixing your errors and then getting back into the code. Uh, anyone will tell you uh, writing code versus debugging code is usually about the same time or sometimes even longer debugging it than it is to write. Writing code is fairly simple. Uh, it's just trying to fix your mistakes. That's the hard part. So if you can cut down on fixing mistakes, then it'll make programming a lot easier for you. So there is a lot of information from these error messages that it gives you. So it's important to really know what what thing it'll tell you. So again, it tells you what's wrong with it. It tells you where to find it and how to fix it. So again, let's go ahead and dive right into this, into this error message. Now, before you would actually even look at the error message, notice if you're in the ISE version, right, right up here, and you're just looking at the code itself, the colors tell you an, an awful lot of how that code is going to run. So for example, you have this X right here. Notice the color, right? All of your variables are going to be a certain color. Like in this case, it looks like they're about orange. However, this variable right here is a light blue. That should tell you right off the bat, something is wrong right here. So if you look, all right, you have this dollar sign X, dollar sign X and all that. Right here, most likely it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you an error. So let's go ahead and go back and like we run it. And then this is the error message that we're going to get. It says the term X is not recognized as the name of a commandlet, function, script, file, or operable program. So again, it tells us right off the bat, hey, I don't know what this term X is, all right? Then it tells you at what line and what character. Now, this is super important, right? So it tells us line two. So let's go to line two right here, character eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is right at that X. All right. It also, if you come down here, it underlines it for you. You see this little tilde? It actually underlines what part it doesn't understand. And it says, hey, I don't understand this X. And as you can remember from yesterday, right, all variables must start with a dollar sign. So this is just a simple mistake where you just left out that dollar sign. Again, as you get more and more familiar with PowerShell and as you get more and more familiar with reading those errors, this will become a lot easier for you. All right, now let's go ahead and talk about changing directories. Now, before we even talk about directories, we have to understand what is a directory. So understanding how to change directories, first of all, we now know even what is a directory. So another name for a directory is folder, right? So of course, inside of computers and all that, you have multiple different folders and files that you can get into. So if you go to File Explorer, right, you can see what drive you're in, and what folders there are. And it's important as a programmer to be able to go between files, to be able to go between folders and directories. And it's even more important in PowerShell to be able to do that inside, inside of PowerShell. So again, there's going to be several commands that we need to become familiar with in PowerShell. So the first command we'll talk about is set location, set dash location. The aliases for this are SL, CD, or CHDIR. The CD and the CHDIR are not PowerShell native commands. The set location SLR, CD and CHDIR uh, are come from uh, the uh, Linux base and uh, Windows on, you know, how to actually change directories. 
set location as the verb dash noun, right? That is going to be your PowerShell native commandlet. Again, alias is just another way to do a nickname, you know, a shortcut per se of set location. So again, when we talk about changing directories, all we're doing is changing folders, all right? So if you want to go dive down deeper into a folder, into another folder, if you want to go up a directory, you know, into another folder, you can do that too. So again, that's going to be set location. Another command that you need to be familiar with is cd dot dot. So cd dot dot goes up one directory. Another command is, is good to be familiar with is cd tilde, cd space tilde, and that changes to your home directory. Uh, and then again, just a little bit more of a definition on set location, at least for syntax. So when you do set location, you can do tech path and then whatever path you want to go to. All right, so you can get out the full path name uh, or the relative path name. And then lastly is the get child item. Now get child item will list all the files and folders that are in your current directory. So again, this is very, very important. The aliases for get child item would be GCI or ls or dir. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into PowerShell and let's go ahead and go through these commandlets and I'll show you exactly how you go about doing that. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right into it. Let's go ahead and go into how to change directories. But before we do that, let's go ahead and look over right here. I'd like to draw your attention to this part of the screen. So we have C drive, users, and then Jared. So as you can see up here, this is where we are currently sitting at in our directory. So we have the C drive users and Jared folder. All right. So again, if we want to go, you know, change directory, let's say we want to go up one directory to do that. We do CD dot dot notice what happens. So we lose this Jared and we actually jump up one directory. Now we're in the users folder. All right. If we would do that again, we go all the way to the C drive. And then if I try doing that again, Notice I can't go any further up. So we're already at the root directory there. So now let's go ahead and do CD space tilde. All right, now this goes to our home directory. And in this case, our home directory is the Jared folder. All right, so C drive users and then Jared. So now we talked about CD, CD, dot, uh, CD dot dot, and we've talked about CD space tilde. So let's go ahead and do uh, set location. So set location, and then uh, we can go ahead and do uh, the path, you know, path where we want to go. So what I could do is just go and do C, C drive. So in that case, it would set location. So we would go to the C drive and press enter. Oh, yep. Let's try that again. We got the... There we go. So then we went to the C drive. So again, set location, tech path, um, C drive. Now, again, we can do other things like such as CD. That's the same thing as set location. Also SL is the same thing. So we could do CD. Um, let's say we want to go somewhere uh, like users. What we could do is just type in US, hit tab, Notice it has that period backslash. Now that means the relative file location. So where you're at, it'll look around and it'll say, oh, I'm in the C drive. Now I'm gonna look, see if there is a users uh, folder, which there is. And then press enter. So again, it shows me I went from C drive to C drive users folder. So again, that's change directory, CD. Also CHDIR is the same thing, right? I can go ahead and type in Jared. And now I'm back into the original uh, folder. So again, that is change directory. Another important thing to remember is get child item. Now get child item, to me, whenever I think about it, anytime you're like kind of looking through files, searching through files, you need to see, or you need to look to see what is, what are the current folders? What are the current files in the current directory that I'm in? So to see that, you can use GCI, which is get child item. All right, so I can go ahead and type out the full name, get child item, and then I can see in my directory, I have these different directories um, 
these different folders. How you can tell the difference between a directory and a file is if you look over in the mode, if it has a D next to it, then you know that these are all directories, which is the same thing as a folder. All right. So usually what I'm doing is if I'm trying to search through a computer, I'm trying to find something. A lot of times I'll do GCI, right, which is get child item. The alias for that is LS or dir. So again, I'm going to type that command in. I'm going to see what's around. And then I'm going to pick one of those. And then I'm going to change my directory to whatever I looks interesting to me. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. So I, I did get child item. And then I'm seeing, hey, this, this directory videos looks interesting to me for some reason. So let's go ahead and change my directory CD to videos. So I type in VID, I hit tab. All right, so now I'm gonna change my directory to videos. Now, once I press enter, you should see that it changes, right? So I go from Jared folder to videos directory. Now, once I'm in there, I wanna see, hey, what is around? What is inside this directory? So how do I see what's inside this directory? Well, we just learned that command get child item, right? Another uh, alias for that is LS. So I press enter, it tells me the directory and it tells me what is inside this directory. So it looks like there's two different directories. There's the captures folder, right? And then there's this UCWT 17X block three PowerShell folder. So let's go ahead and dive one more deep. So let's go ahead and change my directory. So I can do this, I'm just gonna do chdir. I'm going to type in UCWT, hit tab, because I don't want to type out that entire long thing, right? And then press enter. Notice now I'm inside this directory. All right. Now, once I'm inside, again, what do I want to do? Hey, I want to look around. I want to see what is inside this directory. So to do that, I can go ahead and do get child item, press enter. It tells me, hey, this is the directory I'm in. And these are... The two things, notice these don't have Ds in them anymore. So these are not directories. These are not folders. These are actually files. And notice they're .mp4, so that means they're video files, which makes sense, right? Because we're in the videos folder, all right? So these are two different video files. So again, overall, that is how you change your location, right? You set location, right? That's how you do get child item to kind of look around to see what's inside of those files and folders. Now we can go ahead and talk about how to create files and how do we create folders? Well, the command for creating files and folders is actually the same command. It is new item. So for new item, the alias is actually ni, which makes sense, right? New item ni. And this will help you create files and folders. The syntax for creating this is below. So right here, we have new item, all right, or NI, either way. Then you do tack name, and then you're gonna go ahead and give it whatever file name you want. And then you do tack item type, and then you tell me if it's a file or if it's a directory. That's really the only difference when using new item, determining if it's a file or if it's a directory, All right? Everything else is the same. So again, this will help you create a file and this will help you create a directory or a folder. The only uh, interesting note that I wanna go ahead and share with you is be careful if you wanna overwrite something, a lot of times PowerShell will not let you do it. So anytime if it gives you an error saying, hey, uh, it won't allow you to do that, go ahead and try this tack force. So a lot of times PowerShell tries to save you from yourself but if you know what you're doing, right? And uh, you wanna override it with something new. Now, again, it's gonna override it and it's gonna you know, not have what you have before, but it will allow you to go ahead and force, uh, force it to actually overwrite and it'll get rid of that error message. So let's go ahead and go jump back into PowerShell and let's go ahead and create some files and some folders. All right, now we're inside of PowerShell. Let's go ahead and create some files. Let's go ahead and create some folders. So again, we talked about the command for this was new item. So let's go ahead and type that out. So we have 
new item. The next thing we need is the name. What are we gonna name our new item? So let's first, let's create a folder and then later we'll create a file to go inside that folder. So if we're gonna go ahead and create a folder, let's go ahead and just say, let's call this Jared's PowerShell folder. All right, so we have the name and then we need to also tell what item type is this gonna be? So we can't type in folder you know, if I try auto tab, that doesn't work, but let's try directory. There it is. So again, my type, anyways, I'm notice I'm tabbing quite a bit because that helps me uh, make sure I spell everything correctly. So I have new item. All right. So it's going to create something new uh, name and then the name Jared's PowerShell and then what item type I want. In, in this case, I want it to be a directory. All right. So if I go press enter, it just created a directory again, a folder called Jared's PowerShell. Now let's go ahead and go inside that folder. And then once we're inside that folder, we're going to create a file. So how do we go inside of a folder? How do we change our location? All right? We can do set location, all right? Which is SL and we can go inside set location for Jared's PowerShell. So let's go and press enter. All right. Now we are inside of this new folder, new directory that we just created. Now, once we are in here, let's go ahead and create a new item. But in this case, we're gonna create a file, but I'm just gonna go ahead and use what I have it from before. So new item, in this case, I'm gonna change the name of it, all right? So I'm just gonna create a, a text file called powershell.txt. But again, this is, a, I don't wanna create a directory. I don't wanna create a folder. I wanna create a file. So now we have new item with a name, powershell.txt, and it is a file. So press enter and look at that. So we just created this text file, powershell.txt. Notice it doesn't have a directory, so it's not a directory, it's not a folder, but it is in fact a text file. And the length is zero, which means there's nothing stored inside of that file. A, another cool uh, thing that you can do right, is if you don't want to do new item to create a directory, what you can do is you can use uh, another uh, Linux command, which is MD, right, or MKDir. So if you want to make a directory, let's say we want to go ahead and make a directory. Uh, in this case, we can go ahead and call it, you know, let's say Bob's folder. Boom. So now we just made a directory, right? Called Bob's folder. We can also do mkdir, which is going to be the same thing. All right. And let's call this Ellie's folder. All right. Now let's go ahead and do GCI, which is going to show us everything that we've created so far. So we have Bob's folder, which is a directory. We have Ellie's folder, which is a directory. And then we have this file powershell.txt. And notice it is not a directory. All right, now we're going to talk about how to create or write to a text file. So as you can see on the right hand side, we have this variable called text, All right? We know it's a variable because it starts with that dollar sign. And then we have this right angle bracket. That right angle bracket creates a text file and it overwrites whatever is inside that file with new information. So if we look up here, so whatever is stored inside this variable text will be redirected into this file.txt. So again, what does it do? It takes the variable text, it creates this file, and it overwrites whatever is stored inside this file with this. Now, if there is no file, it will go ahead and create that file and then it'll store this information inside this variable into this file.txt. The double right angle bracket appends this information to this text file. And again, we talked about appending something that's just adding to the end of that text file. So in this case, whatever is stored inside this variable text will be appended to the end of this text file. All right, so let's go ahead and do a do an example ex, example of that. 
And again, it's pretty cool because we just talked about how we can create files. Now we can talk about how we can write or put information into a file. All right, so let's go ahead and get the content here. And now again, we're trying to, in this part, we're trying to add stuff to a text file. So notice we already have this PowerShell.txt. So let's go ahead and start adding information and redirecting that, that, that information, that value into a text file. So let's go ahead and let's create a variable. All right, so let's go ahead and create a variable A. Uh, let's say this variable is just a string. All right, so we have this string called I love cheese that is now saved as variable A. All right, so if we print out A to the screen, it's I love cheese. Now, let's go ahead and take that variable and let's store that information into this text file, PowerShell.txt. So let's go ahead and do that. So to do that, again, we're going to use that redirect, which is that right angle bracket or that greater than sign. So we're going to take that variable A, we're going to overwrite this PowerShell.txt with the with whatever stored inside the variable A. And in this case, variable A has I love cheese in it. So it's going to take I love cheese, it's going to put it in it. Remember, if there's one greater than sign, that overwrites this text file. So it's going to press enter. All right. Now, did it work? I don't know. Let's, let's find out. We need to use a command that we'll talk about in a little bit, but how do we get the content of that text file? Well, there's actually a command called get content. So let's go ahead and use that get content. And then we would just do the text file and it'll get the content of that text file. Makes sense, right? So let's go and press enter. And then what it happened here is it got the content of the PowerShell and notice in that text file was I love cheese. Hey, so it looked like it actually worked. That's great. Now, instead of overriding it, let's go ahead and add something to the end of that text file. So let's go ahead and say, maybe we want to store, um, you know, I, I hate chocolate, which I definitely don't hate chocolate, but that's beside the point. All right. So we're going to store this string at the end. Now we don't want to override it, right? We want to keep, I love cheese in there, but we just want to add this to the end of it to this PowerShell.txt. So again, notice I hate chocolate is going to be added to the end or appended to this text file press enter. Now let's go ahead and do get content. GC is the alias. And then let's go ahead and do get content of this text file, press enter. And then boom, it worked. So we still love cheese. It's still written there. But I hate chocolate is added right after. All right. So we talked about overriding, we've talked about appending. So let's just do one more where we overwrite just to make sure that it's actually gonna overwrite it. Say, uh, let's say we do oops, all right? And we're gonna overwrite this file with oops because we really didn't mean to overwrite it, right? So PowerShell.txt, we're gonna overwrite it with oops and let's see if it actually worked. So get, co uh, get content of PowerShell, press enter. Look, now I love cheese and I hate chocolate were overrided because we had the single right angle bracket with this string, oops. So whenever we get the content of this text file, it just prints oops to the screen. Now, a cool thing also about PowerShell is it can actually bring up text files. So if you want to actually just say, hey, bring this text file PowerShell uh, through Notepad to the screen. So what you can do is just press that button, press enter, and then that should go ahead and bring it to the screen. All right, again, and we kind of already went over this again, but writing to a text file, we talk about redirecting. So redirection is just a way to tell PowerShell to take the results of a command and to redirect or to put them somewhere other than the PowerShell window. So in this case, we're re redirecting some information 
right, or the results of some command, and we're putting them, instead of the PowerShell window, we're redirecting them to a text file, right? So again, if we want to redirect our output to a text file, we can use the right angle brackets to redirect. And again, if it's a single right angle bracket, that's going to overwrite. If it's a double right angle bracket, that's going to append to the end. So again, so this is, I am the best is going to overwrite this text file. And then I am the greatest will append to that text file. Now, I want to talk about reading from files. Now, we kind of already went over this, but I want to go ahead and just make sure that it's fresh in your minds. So if you would like to read the contents of a file, there is a command for that. So anytime you're reading files, you want to use the get-content. Again, verb-noun. The alias is gc. Also, you can still use cat and type. All right. And again, I don't really care personally which command you use. As long as you understand what command you need, then you're good to go. That's the cool thing about programming. There's a million different ways, you know, to skin a cat. So I don't really care which way you choose, as long as you understand it and you're good with it, then that's good good enough for me. All right. So again, the uh, the syntax for get content, get dash content, and then you have whatever that file name is after that. Another important thing uh, to use, and you'll actually be using this uh, later on in a group project, is reading information from a text file and storing it in an array. So if you want to, what you can, a cool trick, right, is if you want to actually store information from your file into a variable, this is a great way to do it. So what you can do is you can get the content of your file and then save that content of, you know, into a variable such as array. So let's go ahead, right? And let's go ahead and show you exactly how to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and show you how to, uh, to uh, get content from a text file and then store that content into a variable. So here we go. So let's see if we have, let's first of all, go ahead and get child items, see what's around. Looks like we have this PowerShell.txt, right? So let's go ahead and read that content to the screen. So how do I do that? Get content. Another alias is GC, cat, or type. Those will all work. So if I get the content of PowerShell.txt, again, the content is oops. All right, let's go ahead and actually add some more stuff to that. All right, so again, how would I add stuff to it? Well, I wanted to append, right? So let's go ahead and create, I don't know, let's create a, um, let's create a variable called vehicles. And let's make it an array. And then we have Ford, Chevy, and I said go with Tesla. All right. So now we have this vehicles, Ford, Chevy, and Tesla. Boom. Let's go ahead. And, now let's add those three items to that text file. So let's go ahead and do that. How do we do that? Well, we have to go ahead and type in vehicles. And to add to a text file, we don't want to overwrite. We want to add it. So we're going to use the double right angle bracket. And then whatever that text file name is, powershell.txt. All right, so let's go and clear my screen. Let's go ahead and cat, right? That's the same thing as get content, or you could have used type either way. And then let's cat out this PowerShell. So hopefully we should have, yep, oops, Ford, Chevy, Tesla, perfect. All right, now let's say I have this this huge, humongous text file, right? And I want to store uh, the information of that text file, the contents of that text file into a variable. How would I do that? Well, just so happens, you can just say variable equals and then get content, right, of that file. So what happens here is it gets, gets the content of this text file and it stores it assigns it to this variable called array. 
So if I go ahead and press enter, again, it didn't look like it did anything, but it was actually storing that information into that array. And now I can go ahead and just print out array to my screen. And then that cool. Now inside of array is the contents of that text file. Pretty neat. So now the cool thing is now that it's a variable, I can actually do things with it. I can do some pretty neat things. I can do uh, array operations like index, right? I can do array operations like dot length, right? So I can do, you know, array dot length. All right. And it tells me, Hey, there's four items, right? I can also do index. Okay. What is the zero index of array? Well, that's gonna be the first item, which is oops. All right. Also, I can say, okay, well, give it, give me the second to last item, negative two of that array. That should be Chevy, right? So again, it's pretty cool. Once you actually, you're able to pretty much uh, import information from a text file and store it into a variable, and then you can do some cool like array operations on it. All right, so next we need to talk about how do we write to the screen? There are two main ways that you can write to the screen or write to the console, right? The first one is write-output. Now, write-output has several aliases. You have write, you have echo, um, or of course you can say write-output. All right, and again, this is just pretty much putting it onto the screen. So if you want, you know, the screen, uh, you know, if you want to output something to the screen, you would use write. All right. You know, fairly simple. The cool thing about write is you can actually use, you know, write and then a variable and then I'll, that'll output that variable to the screen. You can also use write, the write output command with a redirect or with a pipeline, which we'll talk about later. So the cool thing about that is you can say write output hello world and then you can redirect that to a file. So it would actually store hello world into a file. All right, and we'll get to that, uh, that write or write output command in a second. I wanna go ahead and go over the second type of writing to the screen. And this is the write dash host command. Now there is a big difference between write host and write output. Write host is actually writing it to the screen but you aren't able to redirect it to another file or you can't pipe it. So in other words, you can't take the, uh, the output of that command and put it into another input. All right. So again, for write host, the cool thing about write host that you can do is you can actually make the font look pretty. You kind of change the colors, kind of do some stuff like that. But if you're ever wanting to redirect it into a file or to do something with it, just know you're better off going with the write output command. So let's go ahead and, and switch back over to PowerShell. And then we'll go ahead and uh, display what these two PowerShell commands can do. All right, so let's go ahead and start out with the write output command. So again, we have write output. And then we can go ahead and do the most famous string of all time for programming, which is hello world. All right, so if we do write output and then quotation marks, hello world, it will output hello world to the screen. Notice if we do the same thing with write host, really there's not gonna be any difference that we can see. All right, it'll still display hello world to the screen. But one of the most important things I was wanting to show you, right, is that you can't, host and redirect it to a file. So again, let's go ahead and do it with write output. So you can do write output and say, hello world. And then you can actually redirect that to a file. Let's just call it text.txt. All right. So now if I do GCI, I can see my text.txt has 30. So again, it's actually showing you that it, it has um, you know, it has something actually stored inside of it. So if I do get content of text.txt, it should show me hello world, which it does. All right. Now let's go ahead and try it with write host. Now I told you that it, it shouldn't actually work. So if I say, 
right host, hello world, and redirect that to, let's say, another text, text2.txt, it shouldn't work. Now, you should see something interesting here. It actually displayed it to the screen, right? So what I believe is happening is it's displaying this to the screen, but yet there's nothing left over, so it's just forcing this text2.txt to create something, but it's not storing anything inside of it. So if I do GCI, you'll notice there's this text.txt that still has hello world in it, but then there's text2.txt, which we just created, but it didn't store hello world in it. That's why there's nothing there. So if I say, hey, get content of text2.txt, text2.txt, it doesn't show anything. So again, it didn't, it wasn't able to actually do that redirect. But there are some good things about write host. Right? So I can go ahead and say write host hello world and do some kind of neat stuff. So I can do, um, after that, I can do tack foreground color. And I can choose kind of a neat, uh, let's say a neat color. Let's go with a green. And then I can do a tack background color. All right, let's go with uh, black. So now that will change this string, hello world. The foreground will be green, the background will be black. So again, there we go. So we got hello world looking kinda, kinda snazzy. So again, that is the write host command. So write host, just in summary, is good for like changing colors, kinda making the font look pretty. Uh, whereas write output is if you want to redirect or if you want to use that in a pipeline or anything else. Most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, I'm using write or write output. I rarely ever use write host unless I want to change the font. All right, the next command we want to talk about is user input. All right, so the command that anytime you want uh, input from the user is going to be your read-host command. Again, verb dash noun like most powershell commandlets so again the user input command which is read host allows you to ask a question and then that user can go ahead and input their response and then whatever they input for their response will be saved in that variable that you have on the left side of that assignment operator that equal sign so again the cool thing about the read host command it, it pretty much allows the program to interact with the end user. So if you want some information, if you want to ask them a question, it allows you to do this and to save their response as some sort of variable. So in this case, you can kind of see we have this variable X and then we're assigning their response of, we're gonna ask them a question, right? And then whatever response that they type in will be stored inside this variable X. Now remember, whatever they respond will always, always, always be a string unless we explicitly tell it something else. So let's go ahead and go into an example. So the first example is we have a variable age. And again, we're going to use the read host command and we're going to ask them, please enter your age. So what's going to happen is they're going to enter a number whatever they enter is going to be stored inside that variable age. So remember the important note for this right down here is that age, because this is read host, even if they enter a number, it's still going to be stored as a string. So again, we have to remember how do we force PowerShell to store that input as a number. Now, again, we don't always want to store it as a number. For example, if we ask them for their name, we want that to be a string, right? We don't want that to be a number because you know your name, Bob or whatever, is a string, right? But if we're asking, hey, enter your favorite number or you know something like that, we would want it to force it to actually be a number, variable type. Uh, and then I'll also get into using user input as a secure string. So this is kind of cool uh, where you can actually have whatever they saved uh, to be saved as a secure string. So if you're going to ask them 
for any type of uh, critical information or anything like that where you want it to be stored uh, as a secure string, uh, you can actually do that by using this dash as secure string. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do both of those examples. And then let's go ahead and jump on over to PowerShell. All right, so let's talk a little about this read host command. So first, let's do an example. Let's say we're going to ask them, hey, what is your name? So like most games or, you know, any type of program where you want user input, you want to ask them, you know, get to know them a little bit, you know, enter their name. So again, be very careful. You always, anytime you use read host, you want to save it to a variable. You don't have to, right? I could do read host and I could say, you know, please enter your name. Now what's going to happen here is it's going to ask for a prompt. I'm going to type in Jared, but again, it doesn't store it anywhere. It just prints it to the screen. So it's kind of pointless unless you're actually saving their response somewhere, right? So again, you want to make sure that you actually save that to a variable. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we're asking them for their name, let's, you know, make it make sense. So the variable, we're going to call it name. We're going to go ahead and use my read host command, which means we're asking them for input. And then we're going to say, please enter your name. So again, we have this read host command. We have this, please enter your name. This is going to be stored inside of the variable name. So let's go and press enter. And let's say our name is Bobby. All right. And then let's see if it actually works. So let's go ahead and uh, type in name and then look, it worked. All right. So we got Bobby is stored inside of, inside of name. Great. Now let's do something else. All right. Let's ask them, hey, please enter your favorite number. All right. So number equals read host. Please enter your favorite number. All right. So go and press enter. And then we enter, let's say 76. And then we say, okay, what is actually stored inside of number? Well, what is the variable type? All right. Notice it is a string. But that's not what we want. If we're asking them for a number, we actually want to save it as a variable type number. But again, remember, read host will always, always, always save it as a string unless you explicitly tell it to not. So to change that, all we have to do is go back to that original command, come back to the beginning, and force it to be an integer or a double or some sort of number variable type. So in this case, we have integer, press enter. So it plays in your favorite number. Let's say we do 12. Now, if I do number.getType, it should tell me, hey, this is an int 32, which it is. Cool. All right, so the last thing I wanna do is show you the as secure string. So let's go ahead and clear my screen. Now I'm going to go ahead and do password. And I'm going to ask them, right? I'm going to use read host. I'm going to say, please enter your password. All right. Now, if I just leave it like this, that's not going to save it as a secure string. The the only difference, right, is I have to do this tack as secure string. Now, whenever I press enter, right, it's going to say, please enter your password. But because I have this as secure string on there, whatever I type in, notice is an asterisk. All right. So again, that's pretty cool. So you can't see what actually I'm typing in. I go and press enter. But then I'm like, oh, okay, well. Let me just see if I can actually just see what it is. I'm just going to go ahead and print out the contents, right? Or I'm just going to, you know, show what's stored inside a password, right? Press enter. It just tells me what variable type it is, right? It just shows me, hey, this is a secure string. 
I'm not going to let you see what it is. So pretty cool. All right. So again, that is the read host command. So anytime you're using user input, you're going to want to use this command. All right, here's just a little bit of a bonus nerd data. So you might have a question. Is it possible to read and compare strings? It actually is, or secure strings, it actually is. So again, I'll go ahead and let you look through this slide. If you want to look through it, you can go ahead and do that. Again, this is a little bit above and beyond. So if you, you know, if you're not that much of a nerd, go ahead and skip over this and uh, go to the go to the next slide. All right, so we just finished with useful techniques. We talked about saving and writing scripts using ISE, how to read errors. We talked about comments and code yesterday. So again, if you need a refresher, go back to yesterday's uh, uh, yesterday's videos. We talked about changing directories. Remember that was CD or CHDIR, which is also an alias for set location. We talked about uh, get child item. So if we want to see what's inside of a directory, we also talked about outputting to the screen, right? We talked uh, about write output. We talked about write host. Uh, we also talked about creating text files, all right? Uh, which was new item. Also, we talked about redirecting information into text files or writing to text files. We talk about reading files, which is your Git content, which is cat and type also are the aliases or GC. And then we also talked about uh, user input, which is your read host command. So in the next part, we will go over flow control, which is really, uh, really fun. But again, everything is building on top of each other. So make sure if you don't understand anything, go through the video again. Uh, make sure you're messing around with PowerShell. You're trying to get uh, get your reps in, trying to figure it out. Um, because it is super, super important. You know this information once we get into flow control. So flow control, we're going to start learning about if else conditions and switches. And then tomorrow we're going to get into loops. So...